I was wondering if you could tell us how it all really began. Where did you get your inspiration to get into this kind of business? Well, it wasn't really an inspiration. I, uh, years ago, I want, when I was a kid, I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be in advertising. But I was always good at writing. And it just happened I found a job for this comic book house. Um, I didn't wake up and say, gee, I want to work for comic books. But I was looking for a job, and somebody told me they needed a writer at a place called Timely Comics, which later became Marvel. And I figured, okay, I'll go there, and until something better comes along, I'll stay at that. And I've been there for more than 35 years. And I never thought, you know, until recently, I never thought it was a permanent, steady job. It was just something I'd be doing while I was waiting for that big break to come along. What was the first character you created, and how did it come about? You know, I really don't remember, because I did so many of them at Timely. But when we changed to Marvel Comics, it's sort of, that's when everything really began to happen. That was about 17 years ago, I guess. And the first uh, of the Marvel char characters was the Fantastic Four. And then came the Hulk, and then Spider-Man, and Doctor Strange, and Thor, and we were off and running. But before that, I was creating characters... Uh, like five a week, you know, anything, any word that I would think of became a character, you know, Father Time, Dr. Droom, he preceded our Dr. Doom, anything, any sound, we, we had monsters, we said, let's get a monster and call him Gore, or Zoom, or, you know, we'd write anything phonetically and say, hey, that's a good word, we'll make it the name of a character. <laughs> How many characters, you have any idea at all? Oh, no, but it must be hundreds and hundreds. But it wasn't just me. Everybody in the business was doing it. You know, all the all the writers were just making up characters. That was the name of the game. Do you have? I, I just did more than anyone else. Do you have a favorite one of the ones you're doing now? I guess I'd have to say Spider-Man, just because he's the most successful, and if so many people like him, he's got to be my favorite too. But I really enjoyed all of them when I was writing them. Uh, it's almost like asking a parent who his favorite kids are. You know, you you like them all. Silver Surfer, I've always loved. I liked Doctor Strange because it was I was able to write it in a different style, and I liked Thor because I could have him talk in sort of a pseudo biblical and Shakespearean style, and uh, I liked the Hulk because I had him grunting most of the time. But basically, I, no, I loved them all. <laughs> dialogue was easy for the Hulk. Yeah. <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, the dialogue was tougher for the Hulk because each grunt had to be very meaningful. So you spell a grunt a little different way each time. Huh? That's right. So it wouldn't get boring. <laughs> What does it take to keep a character such as the Hulk or Spider-Man alive for so many years? Mainly, I think, a lot of luck. I, um, I always wondered, you know, when will the reader get tired of him? But I think there's something built into the character that the readers like. Uh, Spider-Man, for example, I think he's so realistic, the, the reader can relate to him and empathize with him. And the Hulk, I think, is so unique that certainly nobody like him. But... It, we have to keep coming up with reasonably good plots, and the most important thing, I think, is unusual situations within those plots, you know, and unusual uh, surprises for the reader all the time. That's the toughest thing. After you've been writing something for years and years, how do you still come up with surprises? That's what we have to work the hardest at. And we also try to get good characterization. It's important, even though they're comic book stories, it's important that the characters behave the way such a character would behave in real life if there were such a character. Not that I'm saying there aren't such characters. <laughs> what about the Spider-Man? When did you create him and how did that come about? Oh, that was years ago in about 19, I don't know, 62 or 3 or so. And uh, the reason was I, I was thinking, why not try to do one character that's totally different than all the other superheroes, a guy who doesn't always win at the end, a guy who occasionally falls on his face and it was all kind of human traits like he worries about acne and dandruff and allergy attacks and ingrown toenails and I, I sort of thought of him as the Woody Allen of the superheroes you know and I did it really as a gag for myself wondering how it would turn out I never suspected he'd become so popular Spider-Man became a cartoon how involved were you in that? Um, not terribly uh, I spoke to the people who produced the cartoon told them how I thought it should be done and how I felt about the character, but they went out and did it on their own. Today it's different, though. We're uh, going to get very heavily involved in films and cartoons and also live-action films of our characters, and I will be 
much more involved now. At that time, I was just the editor, and I didn't have much to say about it. Now, I'm the publisher, and uh, I will be the one who says this is the way to do it. So I'm hoping that'll be for the better. Do I detect that you were at least a little bit displeased with the cartoon character Spider-Man? Well, I, I had wished it had been done uh, more expensively. It was very inexpensive animation, what they call limited animation, you know, with a, an absolute minimum of drawings so the characters don't move very smoothly. And I think a lot of the Spider-Man fans were disappointed. With what they had to work with, they did the best they could. I mean, I thought the shows were kind of good, but I wish that it had been a more expensive production. Now, you spoke of live action. As I've been seeing in the uh, papers here recently, Spider-Man is roaming around Indianapolis or has been here in the past few days. He and Captain America, in fact, as we stand and talk, they're at some hospitals now. They're making the hospital tour uh, in Indianapolis. Um, and also, there's a Spider-Man movie being done for CBS TV, a prime-time live action movie. For an, it'll be an hour-and-a-half film coming out in September. We hope it'll spin off into a series. Universal is doing uh, more than a half a dozen of our characters as two-hour made-for-television movies live action for prime time. Some will be out this fall and some will be out early next year. So I think that Marvel Comics is going to be very heavily represented now in, uh, in film. Will we recognize any of the actors' names? Um, the Bill Bixby, I believe, is playing the Hulk in the U Universal production. He's playing the Hulk in his normal identity. And uh, frankly, I don't know the names of the people in the other shows. I don't. There are no name actors that I know of. I think the thought was we wanted to go with fresh, new faces so that the reader wouldn't, the reader would accept it and not think, "Hey, I saw this guy in another show." What can we expect from you in the future? Oh, hopefully, a lot more movies, a lot more comic books. We're working on more expensive comic books now, uh, books to sell for a dollar fifty uh, on slick paper with better printing and for older readers who can afford the money. And more books. We have a number of books that Simon & Schuster publishes of our, of our work, and Gross and Dunlap publishes some. And basically, I would hope we'll be spreading out into other forms of the media, television, movies, and books, and more expensive magazines. I'm delighted that Marvel has caught on the way it has, and I'm delighted so many older people enjoy it. And even for the young kids, you know, a lot of parents sometimes say, gee, I wish my kid didn't just read comics. I want to say to those parents, don't worry, because nobody just reads comics. And the beautiful thing about comics for younger kids, it teaches the reading habit, and it makes kids realize that reading can be fun, and then they go on to other things. It's probably the best way to combat televisionitis that I know of. Thank you very much, okay. Stanley. It was a pleasure. Thank you.